my name is Dawn Kennedy. I'm a certified team lead in the Power Up program. I work with students who have graduated fourth grade or third grade and are going into fourth grade in the fall. So in 21st Century Learning Power Up program, we focus on academics and social emotional learning and physical movement. So in reading, we are looking at things like students' eye ready scores, but we're connecting all of our reading to our outings. So the the first week we read about artists like uh, weavers, potters, painters, um, we learned about soft sculpture, we learned about how ancient people learned to weave watching spiders, and then we went to the Speed Art Museum in Louisville and enjoyed all kinds of art, including all of those things. Um, then the next week we studied science in our reading, force, motion, gravity, and we went to, to Sky's the Limit. Um, in math, we're also we're working on those foundational skills. What we're also building a bridge toward fourth grade. That is exactly what it is. Somebody that's the same as you in different ways. So there's a lot of teachers in this school. They're my peers, or we could divide it up. Some of the teachers are new. They're uh, last year we had Miss Gibson in fifth grade. She was about 22. I have kids older than that. I've been teaching longer than that. She's my peer in that we are both teachers. She is not my peer in that we are very different ages. Does that make sense? So what is peer pressure? If peer is somebody about your age, do your friends put any pressure on you? No. I don't mean this. Can you put up your hands? I don't mean this. I don't mean do your friends play games and do that. I don't mean this. I don't mean this. What do I mean? What oh. do sometimes friends do? What kind of pressure can peers put on us? Um, sometimes they put pressure on us and they try to make us feel like... To what? Touch your ears if anybody's ever tried to get you to smoke. Somebody did me, I was in fourth grade. Okay, Miss Maddie raised her hand. Touch your ears if somebody's trying to get you. Touch your ears if somebody has tried to get, no, let's see. Touch your nose if somebody's tried to get you to leave somebody out. Somebody's done that to me even when I was a grown up. Okay, so what is peer pressure? Oh, let's think. Think a minute. Think. Good morning, my name is Kim Silva and I am a New Highland Elementary Records Clerk uh, during the school year, uh, but over the summer I am a lead instructor for our 21st century summer program called Power Up and I am teaching the incoming third graders. Once you call me, I double check my work and that will be a good reminder for you to double check your work and then she knows that you double check your work and that you're completed and that is a lot more appropriate than just yelling out, I'm done! Do all the paperwork. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we're handed that. Okay, how many reds? I got Harlow. Yeah. Move this hula hoop around the group without letting go of your hands. Got it? That means you're going to have to, like, move your body parts. Like, oh, I need to move. So like if I'm holding somebody's hand, then I have to like, and like if I use my hand, that person's hand's coming with me, okay? So I'm gonna move it, and then I gotta step out of it, and then now it's on this person's this side, okay? You guys have done this in PE before. We have. Okay. Oh, perfect, okay, awesome. Here you go, she's pretty good. Which way should we go? Teamwork, which way should we go? Okay, okay so we're going, hey, listen, we're going that way. Stuff. All right, hold the person's hand. You're holding hands. <laughs> you need to this side.
Hi, I am Miss Moore. I'm the guidance counselor here at New Highland, and I come in during the summer to give social emotional lessons to the kids. We talk about conflict resolution, ways to solve problems, our feelings, and much more. Same problem, but you could play a game. What could you play? Who thinks they know what you could play? You could play rock, paper, scissors to try to solve it. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, let me get my sheet here. We have a few more examples, and then we're going to watch a quick video. Um, what if someone, they're just being really rude to you, and maybe they're talking about your shoes, they're talking about your clothes, maybe your hair. What could you do? Slide your hand up first. Um, can, um, like, can you stop talking about me stop talking about me like that? Or... So just ask them to stop talking about that? Okay. Yes. Just so, okay, he really stopped. Okay, what would you do? I would either tell them to stop or tell the teacher. So tell them to stop, what would you do, Evan? Um, I would say, stop doing that to me. I don't like it. Good. How about ignoring them? Could you just ignore them and walk yeah, away? Yeah, ignore them. Should you ever say something rude back? No. no. You may think about it. You may want to, which, you know. Boasting. Your opinion and what you think, it's fine. But we just have to be careful with our actions. Because what would happen if this kid is talking about you and all of a sudden they stop and you don't know but the teacher's behind you and then all of a sudden you're like, well, you know what? You have on ugly shoes or you were this or you were that. What's going to happen? You're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble because the teacher didn't hear the other kid. She just happened. She or he happened to be behind you and her you. So we always have to be careful with our words and what we say and our actions. Hello, I am Tanya Desjardins. I am an instructional assistant here at New Highland Elementary. I work with uh, the fifth grade. Um, we are uh, doing a summer school with the 21st Century Grant. And this week, my fifth graders, uh, uh, we inter researched uh, the Louisville Zoo and they uh, did their own uh, research and picked their animals that they wanted in the zoo and they um, created their own uh, 3D zoo um, that they get to take home with them. Then we, uh, the very first project we did is we talked about um, nature and vendors because one, they're sturdier, two, it's cheaper for them to build. Um, and um, so, yeah, they were supposed to build their own dome. Domes, and that uh, is supposed And so then, of course, they did uh, the zoo. Okay, this third one. It says, sounding deep and rough. What is, um, um, it talks about the males. Up in the first paragraph. Libera? Husky. Mm -hmm. Husky. They have a. a husky sound when they are uh, having territories <clears throat> to fend off their turf. They're like, back up, that's my area. Or. My name is Melissa Swift. I'm the 21st Century Coordinator here at New Highland Elementary. This is our fourth year of having the 21st Century Grant. This grant exists because of the Kentucky Department of Education. Our school has been offering extended services 
the last four years to struggling learners. With our program, we're able to offer assistance with math and reading support. We focus on STEAM and we do a lot of project-based learning hands-on. This summer, our students uh, participated the whole month of June. We Each week, we offered a theme of nature, animals, STEAM, so our students were able to do hands-on projects such as planting flowers. They focused on STEAM activities. We did various building activities with marshmallows, with Legos. Um, because of our program, we actually had outside agencies who are our grant partners. They came in and supported us. Dow Chemical came in and talked about what they offer, and our kids did marshmallow towers. We also went to the trampoline park. Our students focused on the STEAM aspect of that. Um, Newton's Law of Motion they learned about. So this summer, we were able to offer so much academic support, but also enrichment support to our students. Not only did they learn additional math and reading support, they had fun learning. Between all the projects and all the project-based learning, our students walked away with so much this summer, and it was because of the 21st Century Grant, and also our staff. To bigger and better things for our students, we are looking forward to helping more students um, overcome their gaps in education between math and reading. We are looking forward to new students coming into our program and another amazing year of Power Up. Everyone will receive the outline of a jellyfish. You guys are gonna cut it, you guys are gonna color it, and you're gonna glue it together. What's yours gonna be named? I think I'm gonna name mine Jelly. My name is Emma and I'm in about to go to fourth grade and my my jellyfish's name is Stephanie and it took a long time to do it. You had to, you had to color and cut it out and then you had to do little scripts and then you'll get a perfect jellyfish. And my and my teacher today is Miss Kennedy and she's the best teacher. My name is Samara. I'm in um, fourth grade. I made this jellyfish. Um, I was thinking uh, because Miss Kennedy, my teacher, she told me, she showed me a few pictures and I got this idea from um, the jellyfish that was like pink and purple. And I've learned that jelly, um, th some things that eat jellyfish are like um, turtles, sharks, whales, and jellyfish eat shrimp, baby shrimp, and that's what their favorite food and what they like the most. And that's what I learned today. My name is Lavera. I'm in sixth, well, I'm going to sixth grade. And my favorite thing about today was learning new things. I, I learned um, how to make a jellyfish and I learned some more about 3.8 and that's all. Hi there, um, my name is Fen Maloney. My pronouns are they, them. I am a teacher at the Louisville Nature Center and today I'm here to uh, run a program we call Animals in My Backyard where we're gonna learn about some of the animals that we have uh, living here in Kentucky. I'm sure that I can actually kind of go around and right. pass things around and make sure we can all get chances here. to pet. Anaya, follow. Where's he? Good morning, y'all. Good, good morning to the few of you who say good morning back. Yeah. Hey. Well, hey. Um, my name is Fen, or if you want to be really fancy, you can call me Miss Fen. I'm a teacher from the Louisville Nature Center, and we're kind of neighbors with the Louisville Zoo. Has anyone ever been out to the Nature Center before? Maybe? Oh, let's see. Does anyone want to share maybe what you did there? If you remember? 
maybe gone on a hike with your family, oh. maybe, yeah, gone to our nature playground, maybe even visited some of our live animals. So at the Nature Center, we learn all about the woods in Kentucky. We have trails to hike on. We take care of a few animals from the forest. Um, and we're open all year and free. So you can come with your family anytime and yeah, come learn all about the woods. But today, I've brought all those special things from the woods to you. So, um, I think this is gonna be pretty much just a little tour through some of our collection where we're gonna be taking a look at all the different animals we might find right here in Kentucky. Um, so I've got, I'm gonna have questions for y'all and I'm gonna call on people who are raising their hands. And if you have questions for me, um, well, same deal. I'm gonna call on folks who are raising their hands. And I think we're just gonna tour through some of our uh, nocturnal animals here to start. I heard that y'all were looking at owl pellets the other day, is that true? Yes. Cool. So, hmm? Don't know. Don't know? Oh. Well, if you missed the owls yesterday, I brought a few owl parts for us to look at today. So we're gonna go through some of our forest animals and then at the very end, especially if we're doing a good job keeping our volume down, raising our hands, staying in our seats, then I have a friend with me here from the forest who might get out and crawl around a little bit. I might carry him around so that we each get to pet. He is a box turtle and his name is Chocolate. Let's see, right now he's burrowed down in the leaves because he is still like, what, why did you wake me up and bring me here? So if we can stay nice and calm and quiet, I think Chocolate will open up to us a little bit and be ready to come out and say hi. So towards the end, we'll get that chance to meet Chocolate if we're good at following our directions. So, just really quick, um, I am, can y'all show me on your hands how old you are? I am this many years old. Cool. All right, get an idea of, get an idea of where we are all at. So, we've got some older friends in the audience here who might know some of our more advanced animal facts. We've also got some friends who might be seeing some of these animals for the first time. So, I wanna get a mix of answers from everybody. And first off, I've got one of those animals that we might all be familiar with right here. Yep, I was gonna ask for someone to raise their hand, but y'all already know. You can just call it out. Who recognizes this animal? A yeah. I see a an antler on the table. Oh, good question. Why is there an antler? Because we're gonna take a look at the animal that that came from too. But you all are exactly right. This is our raccoon. Um, so can anyone raise their hand and tell me what's one clue because this doesn't exactly look like a raccoon that we might see in the wild. So what's one clue that tells you right away this is a raccoon? Yeah, what do you think? The fur. Yeah, what about the fur? It's, it's the color of raccoons. Yeah, it's the color of raccoon fur. Raccoons we might think of as black and white or kind of grayish, but they can have kind of brown or blonde or sometimes even um, kind of ginger, like red-haired fur. So just like, the, um, just like all of the different genes that give us our hair color, raccoons can have lots of different hair colors from their genes as well. Um, let's see, anyone else? What's another clue that told you right away we were looking at a raccoon? Yeah. Yeah, what about the tail? Yeah, it's got that nice stripe pattern on it. Um, so, I'm gonna go ahead and walk around our circle here, and if you've got anything else that you want to look at specifically or ask as I come around, feel free to um, feel free to ask. But we're gonna go ahead and pet right here, and we can just pet going right down the back of the raccoon, 
We're not gonna pull on its tail or poke at its face or anything because those are two of the more delicate parts. Um, but yeah, as I come around, let's just use two fingers and we'll pet going down the raccoon's back. And you can see maybe, do, you, we, do we think the raccoon's gonna feel more like a dog or a cat? <sighs> yeah. So if we were maybe out at night and we saw a raccoon walking around in the alley or maybe crossing the street or coming across a creek to get a drink, would we ever go out and pet a wild raccoon? No. Why not? But they're so soft. But they can't go rich. Yeah, because they might bite. And they might, yeah, have rabies or some other kinds of germs that we want to look out for because we don't, we don't know what kinds of things wild animals are putting their mouths on. So nature centers and museums can give us really important chances to uh, protect and preserve animals long after they've died even um, in ways that we can still learn about them and help protect the other animals from the forest. Uh, I see we have a few questions still. Yeah, what are you thinking? Um, I, ha I saw the real raccoon mm -hmm. at my old door, and it was really alive, and it was on a wheelchair. Yeah, and what time of day was it? I don't know what it is. Was it bright or dark outside? It was light at night. Oh. So sometimes raccoons might even come out in the daytime and see us at our homes. Let's see, yeah, what are you thinking? I saw a raccoon on the house. Cool, yeah, we might see raccoons in our neighborhoods as well. Yeah, what do you think? Why is the face flat? Why is the face flat? Hey, that's a good question. So this raccoon doesn't quite look like a raccoon that we might see in the wild. We don't see any legs. Um, so are there any bones in this raccoon? No. No, there are no bones in this raccoon. It is just a fur at this point. Um, so, uh, people are able to actually do a special kind of science and art mixed into one called taxidermy. Has anyone ever heard that word before? Here, let's say it together. Taxidermy. Yeah, so kind of like the word taxi and then dermy. And dermy actually comes from dermis, which means your skin. So. Uh, let's see, maybe is that if any, we might be a little too young for The Simpsons, but there's an old joke where it goes, I can see your epidermis, and that means I can see your skin. So taxidermy um, is about preserving the skin and fur of an animal. Um, but no bones, so our raccoon friend here is flat. Let's see, uh, before we move on to our next taxidermied, Animal friend. Uh, yeah, do you have another question? Raccoon, why, do, why, will raccoon, why do raccoons growl? Ooh, why would a raccoon growl? Um, I don't know, maybe just each of you think to yourself for a minute, what reasons might a raccoon growl? And then you can turn to your friend or your neighbor and... Raccoons growl because people bother them. Yeah, maybe people bother them. Do you want to tell your friend next to you? You can, you can tell each other instead of all shouting it out to me. Yeah, what are the reasons? All right, so we are gonna move on to another nighttime mammal here. Does anyone want to raise their hand? Who recognizes this animal? Yeah, what do you think? Skunk. Yep, it's a skunk. And not just a skunk. This skunk has a special name that talks about the pattern on its back. It's the same pattern that the raccoon has on its tail. Does anyone think they know the word for this pattern? Let's see. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It starts with an S. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Yep, this is a striped skunk. So this is our eastern striped skunk here in eastern North America. In North America, we might also have our spotted skunks. They're really, really cute. But skunks do a lot more than look cute. What else do they do? 
They, they stink. Yeah, they kind of stink. They might make trouble. They might make trouble. Well, they yeah, they might make some gas. What do you think? They might pee. Um, yeah, skunks and their cousins, like weasels and badgers and otters, all of the all of, uh, mammals that are in a family we call mustelidae, so mustelids, who kind of smell musty, have stinky pee and stinky farts. It's true. Musty. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, other, what other things might we expect a skunk to do here in our woods or maybe in our fields or forests? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How does it make gas? Well, it's actually, it's not a fart. It's actually a special chemical that comes from a gland, kind of like, um, let's see, kind of like our armpits, where we have sweat glands. Skunks have basically a special stink gland. And I don't think this is very nice personally, but some people actually will take a baby skunk out of the wild and take its stink gland and make it into a pet. Um, but taking animals out of the wild to make them pets can sometimes uh, not go so great. And in fact, when we meet Chocolate here in a few minutes, y'all are gonna uh, learn about how he was um, probably an animal in the wild who might have got taken away as a pet. So yeah. Skunks are really cute, but also they belong outside. Um, let's see. Do you have another question or anything? A special word for their stink is called spray. Yeah, we might call uh, that special word for skunk stink skunk spray. So, same thing. We're going to take two fingers and we'll get a chance to pet. Um, as we come around, we can feel how. Uh, dense that outer coat of fur is to protect the skunk from any little bugs or any yeah or anything else like sticks or thorns that it might be yeah crawling through in the forest here does, that, does anyone know I'm thinking of a word that starts with a G does anyone know what we, what we call a baby beetle? We might find it when we're digging in our garden in the dirt. What do you think? Um, Are you still thinking about skunks? Yeah. Okay, what's your skunk thought? Uh, what they might dig for? Yeah, maybe digging up trash that people left behind. Skunks might dig up some tasty roots of plants, like tubers. They might dig up, um, you mentioned those worms. Sometimes the skunk might even dig up uh, mushrooms and use fungus as a food source. So skunks will eat all sorts of things. They are not super picky. Let's see, yeah, do you have another thought? Well, the red ants that we have here in Kentucky, has anyone ever seen red ants around? I think yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully, the red ants that we have here in Kentucky, almost, I'd say 99% of the time, should not be a fire ant nest. So fire ants are all over the southern United States, and they're all over um, Central and South America. But for the most part, fire ants haven't come this far north to Kentucky, um, where we are. If we see red ants, they might be usually chestnut carpenter ants, who are these nice. Does anyone know what color is chestnut? Kind of a, a reddish, brownish, nice kind of uh, bright, um, almost kind of a mahogany color. Well, we have chestnut carpenter ants, and they don't sting. They might have a strong bite because they are excavating tunnels through dead logs and wood. So they might have a strong bite if you were to pick one up and poke it a bunch and say, what are you doing, ant? What are you doing? Are you a fire ant? And they would say, no, leave me alone. I'm a chestnut carpenter ant, chomp. 
and then try and run away. But yeah, thankfully we don't have a whole lot of stinging ants here um, in Kentucky. But we do have to look out for a lot of our forest bees and things. Um, let's see. I want to take questions, but I also want to make sure, is there a clock in here? Perfect. Um, yeah, I want to make sure that we keep moving and have enough time for our animals. So, can anyone raise their hand and who thinks they know what animal these two specimens uh, might have come from? Yeah, what do you think? Um, a deer. Yeah, a deer. Does anyone think they know the specific type of deer? Let's see. Um, yeah, what do you think? A deer. Yeah, do you think you know a special name for the kind of deer? Yeah. Here, wait, do you want to say it? Here, you can whisper it to me. The what? The animal. Some kind of animal, yeah. So, um, I heard someone say a reindeer. Um, well, we actually don't have any reindeer here in Kentucky, but we do have a deer who's named after the color of its tail. Do y'all know what it is? Do you want to shout it out? No. Ooh, that's a good one. Not a buff deer. Yeah, what is it? A white-tailed deer. Is that what you're going to say too? Yeah. So we've got our white-tailed deer here in our forests. Um, so we have, I heard someone say it earlier, what is this part of our deer? Yep, this is our antler. And if we've got the top of the deer, what is this part? The yeah, the leg and hoof. So this is our deer's foot. Um, now let's, let's stay in our seats. We can maybe just try and point our toes on the floor. But does anyone here, has anyone here ever uh, done any ballet dancing? Any what? Any ballet dancing? Anybody Yeah. So does anyone know what it's called when in ballet dancing we stand on the tips of our toes? Uh, let's see. Yeah, do you know what it is when you stand on the tips of your toes in ballet? Standing on, not on our tippy toes. We might call it standing on point. So ballet dancers stand on point on the very, very tips of their toes. And deer actually walk around the same way. So they have their long forearms, and then they have a tiny, short little foot. But their toe and their toenail, with their hooves on them, are basically just always walking around dee -dee 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 -dee, right on the very tips. So a deer is basically always walking around doing a little ballet dance, which I think is just a really fun little uh, thing to think about, a ballet dancing deer. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and circle this way, I think, this time. And first, uh, I want to take our hoof around. And I might just go ahead and pass our antler this way. Um, if Actually, teachers, how do we feel about, potentially, uh, how do y'all feel about our group's capacity to pass? OK, well, yeah, we'll keep, I'll, I'll do that. I'll move the antler, and we can pass the hoof. So. We're going to pet just going straight down. Um, you can feel how hard those nails are that cover up the hoof. Um, this little bit of tape is there to hold uh, some of it together, so that's important to keep it all from falling apart. And if we pet going from the tape down to the hoof, all of the fur will stay nice and in place. But if we pet going up, that's when the deer fur might start to get ruffled and might start to get damaged a little bit. So we only want to pet in the direction it grows. So um, would you like to hold it? And we can pass it down this way. And I'm going to come around the other direction with our antler here. This is another chance for us to feel how tough that bone is. Um, and look for any other uh, maybe clues on the antler of what this deer is using its antlers for. 
here. So I'm going to hold it, but you can feel and you can feel how tough that um, bone is. You can even see how heavy it is. There's kind of yeah. On it. Yeah, there's even a little bit of fur still there. Yeah. How did they get fur on the antler? Well, what part of the deer does the antler uh, grow on? The ear. Yeah, kind of next to its ear up on its head. That's it. Yeah, isn't that heavy? Imagine if you had two of those on your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that super tough bone almost looks like wood. It's not that heavy. It's not that heavy, but imagine if you had two of those and you were trying to run around with them all the time. Mm -hmm. Here. Oh. All right. Yes, yeah, so we can pet going down, going down our hoof. Good job. Here, do you want to see how heavy? Good job. I know. That antler is impressive, isn't it? How does it smell? I know. It doesn't have any special smell, does it? Yeah, it's super tough. It's made of bone. So, our deer has to grow all of this bone each season that he grows his antlers. And at the end of that season, he sheds those antlers. So, after a boy deer has grown up some, Every year, he's going to grow and shed his antlers. Would this be April, uh, spring, summer? Go. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What's your name? Keaton. Yeah, yeah, so Keaton just asked a good question of, do each of these branches show a different season? Yes. Not quite. Each of these branches on the antler is basically going to help us figure out how old was this deer. So as deer get older, their antlers are going to grow with more and more branches. So I don't know the exact trick for figuring it out, but we can count one. Well, actually, let's count together. How many points do we see on these antlers? Let's start here. One, two, three, four, five. So, if, yeah, one second. So, there we go. So, when they're really young, deer might just grow single branched antlers. So, this deer, this might have been an antler that uh, was one of the first ones he ever grew. Whereas, this deer has been growing antlers for a while. How do we get this? Is that your question? Yeah. So that's a really good question, right? Of how do we get all these things? It's our job at a nature center to protect the forest. So why do we have all these parts that come from dead animals? Well, some of them we can find uh, out in the woods. And since we're a nature center and we have special permission, we can take some of those things back with us and uh, keep them to learn from. Um, uh, other ones we might have because other uh, special groups and scientists basically uh, let us borrow them or give them to us. For example, the, uh, in Louisville, we have a really special place called Raptor Rehab where they help big birds of prey who have been hurt get better. Um, so, for example, I have with me here the wing of a, not quite an eagle. This is a big black bird that we might see by the highway with a red head 
with no feathers on it, and it eats dead things. Can anyone raise their hand? Anyone think they know? What's an animal? What's a big bird that hangs out by the highway and eats dead things? Yep, it's a vulture. It's a turkey vulture, to, um, to be specific. Perfect. Thank you very much. So our turkey vulture wing is one of those ones where maybe we've worked with um, a group like Raptor Rehab to take a wing like this from a bird who wasn't able to be healed or wasn't able to recover. Um, and so after that bird has passed on, um, it's able to basically uh, kind of give us a gift of learning from its body long after it's gone. So if we ever saw a vulture in the wild, we would definitely want to give it its space. Because just like the skunk, actually, the vultures are really stinky. And they don't spray, but if they want you to go away, they'll actually throw up, you know? So, but, um, yeah, we can work with other, basically, scientists and other places that help protect the animals in the forests to uh, grow our collections to teach and learn from. Um, so, we've got, what's that? Yeah, have we got about um, 20 minutes until lunch? Perfect. So, do you have a question? Um, what do you mean exactly? Like when they're alive, or yeah. So vultures are not really active predators, but um, they do have pretty good senses of smell. Um, yeah, uh, turkey vultures in particular uh, are, are thought to have a pretty good sense of smell in order to uh, get around and you know find all the dead things that they want to eat. Um, and turkey vultures are also kind of lazy. Um, so this huge wing is good for a couple things. That really big uh, uh, surface area helps push a lot of air. So with each flap, they don't have to work very hard. Um, does anyone know? Let's see, if we wanted to make some tea on the stove in a special pot, does anyone know what that pot that we put tea on the stove in is called? And boil some water, and I could go Yeah, do you know? I'm thinking of one that starts with a K. A pitcher? Not a pitcher, do you know? A Yeah, a tea kettle. And so when we boil our water in the tea kettle, where does all that boiling steam go? It rises, and so on a hot day, all of the air on planet Earth gets heated up just like that steam in the tea kettle, and it doesn't go and boil uh, and steam like that, but it can still rise. And vultures are really good at finding those rising air currents, and with their specially adapted wings, they can just glide all day. And they fly in a special style called kettling, because they ride those gusts or those that rising warm air. And so I'm going to hold our, our vulture wing flat right here, and I'm just going to turn in a little circle. And as I turn, I want y'all to make a guess. So we're going to have a hypothesis. As I spin, will the wing go down? Will it stay in the same place, or will it go up? So keep in your mind, do you think the wing as I spin will go down? Do you think it will stay exactly where it is, or do you think it will go up slightly? All right, so think about the shape of the wing, and then I'm going to go ahead and give it a gentle spin. And I'm not really moving my arm at all, but the air underneath the wing, yep, it's going up makes that vulture rise. So they like to fly in a nice big circle as they kettle their way 
to the top of that warm air. And once they're all the way at the top, just like riding our bikes down a hill, they can just cruise and take it nice and easy. Um, so I mentioned this vulture, who has a silvery wing, is actually called a turkey vulture. Yeah, turkey vulture. So you could also say that bird watchers, um, well actually, so are turkey vultures initials? Does anyone know what those initials are gonna be for turkey vulture? Do you know? No, what are they gonna be? Yep, TV for turkey vulture. So bird watchers like me love to go out and watch TV, turkey vultures. I thought that was pretty funny, but <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, yeah, do you have another question? Uh, sure, yeah, you can ask a question about the deer. You know what kind of hoof it is? What do you know? Um, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, because the, the hoof is pretty small? Yeah, I don't know actually whether this particular hoof might have come from an adult deer or maybe a young deer, but baby deers also have those spots on them, right? So there are some clues we could look for in the fur, but yeah, that's a good thing to think of is maybe was it a big daddy deer? Was it a mama deer? So what kind of individual was this? So I'm gonna go ahead and same deal as before. We're gonna take our two fingers to gently pet. I'm gonna come around with our vulture wing here. And I would like you to feel those stiff, strong feathers that help our vultures glide and stay aloft. Why do, you, why do they feel like that? Yeah, why do they feel like that? Because they're so furry. They're not really furry. They're made of the same stuff as our fingernails and as the scales of lizards and snakes. A special protein called keratin. Some of us might have heard that. To help the vulture glide. And it has really, really huge wings because when they fly in the open sky, they don't have to worry about bumping into anything except maybe another vulture if it flew too close. But if we take a look at the wing of a barred owl, we might see that it's a lot smaller. So this shorter wing is gonna help our owl fly through tight spaces in the forest, fly in between trees and under, uh, and under bushes in order to well, do all the things an owl wants to do at night. What kinds of things might our owl be out at night doing? Yeah, what do you think? Here, so we're gonna come around and pet just like this. Mm -hmm. So the reason why they have some mice is because they need to catch some mice or other tiny animals, so they have to be quiet to get the, um, mm -hmm. the um, that's animal right. because that's why they have soft wings. Exactly, yeah. Um, so you already know how this wing is gonna feel. But yeah, they're gonna be flying silently through the night in order to hunt mice and other small animals. Um, so I heard that you all uh, did your owl pellets yesterday. Um, can anyone raise their hand and tell me uh, what other kinds of things did you find in those uh, owl pellets? Let's see, yeah, what's something that you saw? You So you saw a rat head? So we saw the bones, all the hard parts of their food. Anyone else see anything interesting in the owl pellets? I don't know anything about Yeah, yeah, what do you, what'd you see? A hind leg. Yeah, cool, a hind leg. So can anyone raise their hand and tell me how many bellies does a bird have? How many bellies does a bird like an owl have? 
I heard one person say one. Anyone else got any other thoughts? Anyone else think it's a different number? What do you think? So you think maybe it's three? I, th I heard someone say maybe it's two. Well, two is the right answer. Birds have basically two special bellies. One of them is where all of their um, stomach acid basically um, digests their food, kind of like ours does. Uh, and that's the first belly where they're going to get a lot of their nutrients. But um, there's a lot of parts that can't go into their second belly, which is called their gizzard. So we might have heard of the gizzard in a chicken or um, maybe even uh, the gizzard of a dinosaur who would eat small rocks and pebbles to help grind down its food. So um, birds have one belly basically just to get all the juices out and then another belly to help crush everything up. And with those two bellies combined, our owls can basically separate out all of the tasty bits of the mouse from all of the gross bones and fur. So you already knew this wing was going to be super soft to help the owl fly silently. But can anyone think, um, why, would a, why would a soft wing make it any quieter? Let's see. Yeah, do you have a thought? Um, because an owl has like, very soft fur, and when they fly, like, it doesn't make any like, noise. Like, it's like very soft fur, and it just goes smooth, and nobody can hear it. I, that's, those, are, those are a bunch of good facts. I like that. So imagine if you had a piece of paper. In fact, would you mind helping us out? Would you wave your piece of paper in the air? If you, if you are out and you saw a creature and then you do it like this. So that's our vulture going whoosh, 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 making those big flappy paper sounds. And then our owl with those nice soft feathers just goes shh. Yeah, I really like that with the, with the piece of paper sound. That's a good way to think of it. Because all of the air moving over those feathers has to come back on the other side. And when the air meets its friends off the back of the wing, it gets together and goes clap. But if it comes back off the back of a soft feather, it's just a nice, gentle wave. Yeah, what are you thinking? I have not read that book, but it sounds good. Well, all of fourth grade uh, read that book, and that's why we know all these facts. Cool. Yeah, you mentioned that owls can't move their eyes. I like to say that instead of eyeballs, owls have eye bells, because they're long like ovals. So they can't turn those eye bells in their head. They have to turn their whole head. Okay. Yeah, if we tried to turn our head, has anyone ever tried to take their pulse on their neck? So you know that we have those big, important arteries in our neck that help carry blood to our brains. Well, if we turned our head all the way and tried to look like this, we would actually pinch that little vein in our neck and stop the blood from going to our brain. And you might be like, whoo, I'm dizzy. Well, an owl, its uh, veins actually basically go right through the middle of those bones in its neck. And so instead of all of those important cables getting twisted up and tangled like a kink in a hose, the owl is basically just able to gently turn and have everything uh, move just how it's supposed to. Um, we have 10 more minutes here. And y'all are doing such a good job raising your hands and staying in our seats. So I think it's time to get Chocolate the Box Turtle out. Um, can y'all save your, what you want to tell me for the end? Because I think we're going to get chocolate out here and then it looks like it'll be lunchtime. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and sit here for a second and just hold him for a minute. And if he seems comfortable, I think I'll let him walk around on the floor just a little bit. Um, and after we get a chance to see him move, and either ask any questions or answer any questions. Then I'll pick him up again and take him around the circle, and that will be our chance to pet. 
but we're not going to pet him while he's walking around. If he walks up to you, I think I'm just going to follow him over and readjust him, give him a little spin. Yeah, so this is Chocolate the Box Turtle. And he is one of the eastern box turtles who lives at the Louisville Nature Center. Yeah. So I can already hear, we're noticing that he's walking. We're curious about that beak that he's got. Yeah, what do you think? How old is he? We're curious about how old he is. All right, what do you think? Will he bite? Mm, curious about if he's going to bite or not. So, yep, this is chocolate. Um, he has bitten you once, it's true, but it's because I was hand feeding him a little piece of strawberry and he's kind of clumsy. Um, so he reached out with that big beak and went and took a little chomp of my finger, but it basically just felt like a super slow pinch because turtles don't have any teeth. Um, yeah, no teeth at all. Yeah, because they've got those strong beaks instead. Um, so chocolate was eating that strawberry, so we know he likes to eat some fruit and vegetables. But can anyone raise their hand and think, what else might a uh, turtle like chocolate like to go out into the woods to eat? Let's see. Yeah, what do you think chocolate might like to eat? Turtle. He's not a snapping turtle, he's a box turtle. And he's called a box turtle because he can pull all of his arms and legs into his shell. I'm going to turn him facing up a little bit so we can see his belly. The special bottom side of his shell called the plastron. So look at, we can see this little line on his belly. It's basically just like a flap on a cardboard box. When he pulls his arms back, that flap will close up. Um, let's see. So can anyone else maybe raise their hand and think, what else is chocolate going to use that beak to go out and eat in the forest? <coughs> let's see. Yeah, what do you think he might like to eat? Grass. Well, uh, turtles don't really like to eat grass usually. If turtles eat plants, they usually don't eat the leaf parts. Um, some tortoises might like to eat the big, like, leafy parts of a lettuce, but most of the, most of the nutrients are going to be maybe down in some fruit or um, maybe even sometimes, like, the roots of a plant. Let's see, what other things could a turtle go out and eat? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, do they eat chocolate? <laughs> chocolate? The turtle does not eat chocolate. <laughs> I bet that would make him feel kind of uh, sick. Yeah, what do you think? Does it eat lettuce, like that one? Um, chocolate does not eat very much lettuce. He really likes to eat strawberries and tomatoes. Um, he also really likes to eat bugs, especially one kind of bug that there were a million of like three summers ago. Do y'all remember what bug was everywhere a couple summers ago? Yeah, do you remember? Um, there are a lot of ticks sometimes, but these ones were flying and they go eh, eh, and they scream. Let's see, do you know? Flies? Not flies, but they do fly around and they've got those red eyes. Do you remember? Yeah, they're called cicadas. So cicadas that we get in the summertime, that's one bug that a box turtle would love to eat. A cicada is kind of like a chicken nugget for a turtle. Um, but another thing chocolate wants to do is eat healthy things to grow a strong shell. So if we wanted to uh, grow big strong muscles, we might need to eat some protein. We might need to eat some food with protein for our muscles in it. But if chocolate wants to grow a shell, he's going to have to eat some food with some shell nutrients. So maybe what are some things in the forest that might have a shell that could, chocolate could go out and eat? Let's see. Yeah, what do you think is one? Huh? How does it work? When you drop it, will it break? Um, well, his shell is basically made of his bones. 
If you feel down the middle of your back and then around the side, you can feel your spine and then your ribs, right? So it's the same thing for him. We, he can, this is his spine and these are his ribs. Um, so yeah, if his shell broke, it would basically be like breaking your back. So it would, it would be pretty bad news. But we have a few turtles at the Nature Center who have uh, broken spots on their shells. And so they're there to, uh, so that we can take care of them and help them heal. Thank <laughs> you.